It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 60, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Mike Bollinger raises about three acres of outdoor vegetables and a half acre undercover just inside the city limits of the small town of Decorah, Iowa, with his wife, Katie Prochaska. River Root Farm serves grocery stores and restaurants in its local market in Decorah, as well as in surrounding small cities and Minnesota's Twin Cities. Enterprises at River Root Farm range from microgreens and transplants to fresh herbs and four-season salad greens. Mike and Katie have worked hard to adapt to the marketplace in rural Northeast Iowa as they slowly laid the groundwork for their farm. They found ways of making a living on the farm that didn't put them into direct competition with an already crowded market farming scene in Northeast Iowa. And we dig into how they've gone about testing markets and products to limit risk and maximize potential as they grow the business to a point where they could both make the leap into farming full time. We dive deep into the details of how they made the logistics work for co-shipping and cross-stocking their product by adapting to the distribution system around them. We discuss some of the finer points of producing transplants for sale to grocery stores and other retailers, and we take a look at how River Root Farm harvests and handles their microgreens. It was great to talk to my old friend and my old stomping grounds at Decora, and Mike brought a ton of great information to the table. Enjoy the show. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost based living soils for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Audible. Discover the world of audiobooks and absorb yourself in the latest business management texts, farming essays, or all three volumes of The Lord of the Rings. Get your free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash farmer to farmer. Mike Bollinger, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thanks for having me, Chris. So glad you could join us today. Yeah, I'm glad I could uh, participate. Did you guys get the same ice storm in Decorah, Iowa that we got here in Madison, Wisconsin yesterday? Yeah, we did. You know, we were watching it uh, very keenly. Uh, on the internet to see kind of what path the storm was going to take. And, you know, there were all kinds of different models being run out there. Were we going to get, you know, just freezing rain or a couple inches of snow, or were, were we going to get, you know, 11 inches of snow? And um turned out that it was rain that pretty quickly turned to freezing rain, and we ended up with uh, maybe two inches of snow kind of right on top of that. So so nothing, you know, nothing too heavy. But uh, I was just talking with a friend of mine that's, that's north of here, only about 45 minutes, and they got about eight inches of snow. So I think it was very uh, regionally placed what got dropped. Welcome to March in the upper Midwest. I guess so. So, Mike, can you can you start us off by telling us about your farm, you know, what you guys are growing, how you're doing it, where you're located, and all of that? Yeah, I'll do my best. So uh, we're in northeast Iowa in a smaller community of about 8,500 people. It's Decorah, Iowa. Um, we have uh, two years ago moved to to a new farm, and we'll get into that, I'm sure, a, a little bit about that transition. But two years ago, we moved to a 20-acre property that's just inside the city limits of Decorah that has about 12 tillable acres. Um, at the moment, we're not utilizing this property uh, to its full capacity by by any extent. Um, but right now, we have about um, three three acres of, of actual in-ground production. Um, we've got about a half an acre of uh, high tunnels and greenhouses and um, doing mostly wholesale sales. So um, working with, with food co-ops and, and restaurants. Um, we played with Retail markets a little bit, farmers market and, and CSA. Um, we're doing a winter CSA now for for kind of a short period of, of time in the in the winter. Um, but growing uh, you know diverse vegetables that's changed over the course of our our kind of farming career here in Decora as well. But um, you know in the spring we're growing you know salad greens um, and spinach and you know different Asian greens. Um, we're planting kale things like that in our high tunnels. Uh, in the spring, we're also doing uh, microgreens, and we do a fairly significant uh, seedling sales to some other uh, to some other places as well. Um, in the summer, we transition into um, you know, tomatoes and cut flowers, peppers, uh, things of that sort, try to carry the salad greens through. And then in the, in the winter, transitioning back into, into some root crops and, and more leafy greens. Um, Again, like I said, wholesale, we're wholesale sales. Um, we're sale, selling here in Decorah to uh, to our local food co-op, 
and to a couple of restaurants. Um, and then uh, we kind of stretch out from there into more of our bioregion. We're selling things to, you know, Rochester, Minnesota, to a food co-op there about 70 miles from us, to a food co-op and some restaurants in La Crosse, Wisconsin, about 55 miles from us, you know, Viroqua, Wisconsin, which is about that 70 miles as well. And then we're able to send things up also into the Twin Cities to, to some of their food co-op up in the cities. And we'll get into some of that distribution stuff, I'm sure, as well. Um, and then with the development of uh, the Iowa Food Hub here um, in our corner of Iowa as well, we've been able to sell some, some products there that are going into their, into their food box program, as well as just as that network has, has developed now, we're finding a demand for, for some of our products, even as far as uh, Chicago. Really? Yep. Wow. All, all from your, I mean, three acres, that's not a very big farm. Right. It's not a big, it's not a big farm, but it's, and it's not, you know, it, it's not a broad spectrum of crops because, you know, again, we're limited in the production with the acreage that we have. So it's, it's specific things. Um, you know, it's, it's the microgreens and, and a lot of the, the salad crops um, that we're able to plant, you know, higher density um, and, and kind of move. So, you know, we're, you know, we're not growing a balance of, you know, of a lot of different products like you would maybe for, for a farmer's market. But, you know, we're heavy on the salad greens and on some of those niche products that we've really been able to find a market for uh, to be able to make our farm, you know, really more, more viable since we are in such a, a small community, really with, uh, with a fairly significant number of, of growers that are doing uh, things similar to us scale-wise. Yeah, I mean, decor is interesting that way. I mean, it's it's a I mean, it's a small town, but as you described, being kind of situated not really between, but offset from Rochester, Minnesota, La Crosse, Wisconsin, and I always think of Cedar Rapids as kind of being the third the third leg of that triangle with Decorah kind of in the middle. Um, even though it's a small town, it is very much an economic hub, but it's also it's also a little hipster community, and so it's got a ton of market farmers. And I mean, I. I think a lot of people know I farmed in Decorah for 13 or 14 years um, before we before moving to Madison. And and it was one of the things we really realized early on was there was so much competition for what was a relatively small marketplace that we had to go out beyond that local market and right. and figure out other places to sell our produce. Yeah. And we're you know, we're in the we're in the same boat there. And, and you know, Katie and I moved, um, you know, moved to Decorah in 2009. Uh, our connection to this place was that we had both gone to uh, to the liberal arts college, Luther College, here here in Decorah, and uh, and when when we moved back, we had we had uh, you know, our first child was one years old, Oliver, um, and and we were we were really picking Decorah because it was a place that we wanted to that we wanted to live, um, where we wanted to raise our family, where we felt like we could have you know really you know the quality of life that that we were seeking, and and we knew that it was going to take time. Uh, to be able to to build a farm that could um, you know that that could work in a community this you know this size and that we would have to identify some markets that were outside of Decora um, and and we were okay with that we we weren't in a place where when we when we moved here that you know we had to make a living from the farm we had um, other things that were going on and and really set ourselves up to be in a place where we had time to kind of identify and keep our eyes open you know, what those market opportunities were and, uh, and really kind of go after some of those, some of those niche markets with the idea that, that over time, um, you know, we could expand those things and, uh, and, and really make this thing crank. And you guys started off, I think you bought a farm that was, uh, 10 or 15 miles out of town. Yeah, we were about 10 miles, 10 miles from town. Um, and, and, you know, looking back on it, you know, it, it it's almost more suitable as as a homestead, um, and a, you know, seven seven acres, uh, eastern slope hillside, pretty you know, pretty significant slope to it. Um, it had about three acres worth of ground that was tillable, but those were in terraces. So we had about we had essentially three one acre terraces that uh, that we were able to to work with. I think initially we were really excited about getting back to Decora. Um, at, at that time, you know, my primary focus was going to be, um, you know, dedicating my attention to the startup of a, a greenhouse manufacturing company, Four Seasons Tools, that I helped co-found. 
and and that we you know we were going to start small um, with the farm. I mean, we had also kind of you know our agricultural background uh, it, it, as far as scale was was really along the lines of, of kind of the Elliot Coleman and, and Barbara Damrosh model. I mean, we worked with them for a couple of seasons out in coastal Maine, and you know and, and they had about an acre and a half. Uh, worth of vegetable production, but doing it very intensively, you know, using high tunnels and greenhouses, both, you know, heated and unheated um, to to kind of make the farm work. And, and I think that that was probably the vision that we had in mind. So three tillable acres to us at the time seemed, uh, seemed adequate. What prompted your shift in thinking about that? Um, well, I guess, I mean, there were, so there were a few things. Um, you know what we what we came to realize here was that um, you know that that high tunnel production or that season extension production for us was something that that wasn't really happening around around here. So there was a, a, a huge opportunity there for us to be able to put up buildings and and service you know our our you know local community uh, you know very well by by working with that covered space and and essentially providing products that people were used to and familiar with and, you know, and like to consume, um, at a, you know, at a time of year when, when it wasn't, when it wasn't available. And, and so, you know, very quickly in that first season that we were there in 2009, we moved there, uh, on my birthday, April 23rd in 2009. And, and we put up a, a transplant house that was 22 feet wide by 48 feet long. And we put up two movable high tunnels. Um, from our company that were 30 feet wide and 48 feet long. And we had to um, come in with some fairly large equipment to be able to, to create the platform for where those high tunnels were going to go. And, and at the time, you know, Katie and I had sat down and said, well, you know, okay, what's our, you know, what's our five-year plan? And we thought, you know, three or four buildings that size uh, would be plenty for what we were trying to do. And, um, and so we said, yeah, when, you know, we, we kind of laid, kind of laid it out. Um, but things, you know, things just changed. And as we kind of identified, you know, where those real opportunities were, we knew that, that we wanted to be able to put up, you know, more, more covered space than we were able to, to do on, on that property. And so that was, that was one of the factors. Um, another factor was that we got into some things that we didn't necessarily plan on doing. Um, we, we started growing, Seed um, for uh, for Seed Savers Exchange and and also for for Aaron Whaley, um, who started his own seed company once he stepped away from Seed Savers Exchange. So we were growing uh, you know squash and 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 melon and cucumbers and garlic on a scale that um, that was just that required much more land than than we actually had. So within you know that first couple of years, um, we started renting land. From a from a neighbor, but that property was about three miles from from where we where we were at. Um, you know, didn't have you know didn't have access to, to irrigation, um, but you know, but the, but the price was right and and the convenience at that time seemed seemed to fit. But as as we continued to do that, you know, the second and third year, um, we were in a place where we just. Um, we were trying to kind of reevaluate where, you know, where we were at and, and what the right move was for us. Um, and, and so we were looking for something that was, that, you know, gave us a little bit more tillable ground to be able to do, you know, those sorts of seed production related things as, as well as high tunnels. Um, and then allowed us to, the room to be able to, to continue to expand, um, the, just the, the vegetable production that we had kind of planned on. Uh, and you know, and then we also realized pretty quickly that you know that you know, driving back and forth, you know, ten ten miles to bring produce in uh, to Decora, as well as um, you know to to where the truck was picking up our products to take it to those other regional markets, was a lot of miles and became pretty inconvenient. So all of a sudden, we're bringing kids in to be able to to socialize with their friends or to be able to hang out, and and it had to be really you know really structured. And so when this opportunity presented itself to be able to be essentially a mile and a half from downtown and in the city limits on a larger acreage, um, all those things just really, really, you know, kind of spoke to us. The challenge for us was that we were going uh, in that transition uh, from owning the property 
uh, like you said, we bought that property in 2009 to a long-term lease agreement uh, with the with the landowner, and um, you know, so that was something that we really had to kind of crunch some numbers with and wrap our our heads around as well. But um, you know, the the property that we're on now is so suitable for what we're what we're trying to do, um, and and we're, we're comfortable with the the agreement that we were able to to work out. So. You know, we we talked about you know a minimum of of 15 year lease agreement that we would renew in in five year chunks. Um, so that that five year kind of uh, period of time that we were able to to kind of get in writing allowed us to be able to you know access um, you know some of these grant programs that are offered through the through the USDA and kind of worked out that way. Um, was was a lot, you know was convenient for us to be able to to now have the kids go to public school. Um, it was really easy to be able to drop product off to you know to our markets and for distribution, um, as well as it had the infrastructure. Um, there's you know there's a, we we moved into the house so we rent the we rent the house, and then we rent the 12 uh, tillable acre acres um, kind of in a in a separate agreement to so to be able to kind of separate those things out. Um, but they're you know they're there's a barn here. Um, there's other outbuildings. You know, there's uh, you know there was electricity running everywhere that we didn't have at our other at our old place. And just the the setup of the kind of core acreage here was uh, was a good fit for for what we were trying to do. So um, so we made the jump. I'm really interested in in talking about the logistics. I mean, you talk about. Uh, having to drive 10 miles to town being a difficult drive to have to make for doing deliveries. And I always think about that because when, when we were in Decorah, um, at Rock Spring farm, I was delivering product up to the twin cities. Um, you know, that was like my normal drive for doing deliveries. Um, we were a little further outside of Decorah than you were and actually ended up not doing a lot of business there just because getting to town was in some ways more difficult than, than getting in the refrigerated truck and driving up to the cities. How are you guys managing your logistics? Yeah. So, so now what, what we're able to do, um, for, for moving our food around, uh, has, has worked out pretty, you know, pretty well for us. And, and it was, you know, like most things, uh, you know, an evolutionary process. I mean, at, at the start, um, you know, we were, we were only selling things, uh, here in, here in Decorah. So twice a week we would, you know, we would bring, you know, our vegetables in, you know, drop it off at the food co-op and, and to the, those couple of restaurants. And, um, and really the, the product that took off for us um, early on were, were the microgreens. Um, it was something that, you know, that, that wasn't really known around here um, that was kind of unique to what we were doing. And there was quite a bit of opportunity. So, um, you know, working with our the produce manager here at the Oneida Food Co-op um, with Betsy Pierce, um, you know, she you know she very quickly saw that you know, that there was a positive response, um, you know, to to those products, um, and and said, hell, have you you know have you tried reaching out to you know to the you know to the People's Food Co-op in La Crosse or to you know the Veroca Food Co-op? And I'm sure they don't have these things, and it would be a nice addition. To uh, to what people are able to, to put on the shelves, and so we started you know, trying to figure out how um, you know how we could get those get those things there. And um, I I guess you know the first roadblock for us was we were like, well, you know, with with one young young child and you know me full time at Four Season Tools, uh, you know, it was like, how are we gonna you know, how are we just gonna be how are, we can't really drive that product to to all <clears throat> all of these places, so. Uh, you know, very quickly we tried to identify, you know, where, you know, how is food moving around our region already? And, and are we able to, to kind of tap into some of those things to be able to get our, you know, to get our, our microgreens on, you know, on those trucks? And the co-op here in town has food delivered from, you know, from the Twin Cities um, three times a week. So Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday mornings, um, you know, there's a refrigerated truck that's coming to deliver product to, you know, to that store. And so we, we reached out to them and, and literally just said, what, you know, what's the cost to, you know, to be able to bring things on. And, you know, it's a, it's a flat rate just to, to have the space for the pallet. And then there's, you know, fuel tr- surcharge associated with that. Um, you know, the, the, the thing that worked out in our favor 
as far as those first couple of stores that we that we added in La Crosse and, and Viroqua, again, 55 miles and, and about 70 miles respectively, was that those were the next two stops for that truck. Um, so, so they, for a fairly nominal fee, were willing to be able to, to add those products on um, to that truck and just drop those off at, at those stores. And, and so it became kind of that, that, that evolution of, of how we could, um, you know, move, you know, move those greens to communities outside of our, of our own. Um, and, and then got to a point where, you know, we, we were able to kind of see the list of, of where, you know, where it was, uh, you know, at the time it was a Dyna Couriers. Now I think it's called Minnesota, um, you know, was doing the food distribution down here. And then uh, Wedge Co-op owns Co-op Partners, which is a, a distribution warehouse that was then um, also aggregating product and, 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 you know, sending it out from there too. So we knew that we could, we could potentially access a, a very significant number of, of markets that weren't in Decora if we could get it there and, and, and have, you know, have the right products to be able to justify that expense. And, and for us, I mean, microgreens, as uh, a lot of people, you know, know now are, um, you know, are quick to grow, um, or, you know, easy startup, you know, we're selling things, you know, we've been selling things for several weeks now already, microgreens that we just started in, you know, in, in late February and, and have, uh, you know, have a really nice margin built into the pricing structure with that. So, um, you know, we were able to kind of to kind of make that work, and that opened some doors for us. Um, and then we were looking at the Twin Cities as well. And and at that time, you know, what seemed to be the the you know the best fit for us was through conversation with you and the fact that you were already taking product up to all those stores that we were trying to get into as well. And and with your you know our proximity to you, we're able to to work on an arrangement where we could start getting into some of those some of those stores. For you know, for less of a cost than than working through those those existing distribution routes uh, with with you directly to be able to get those things up. So that again opened the door for us to be able to to start selling some products up into the up into the Twin Cities. And and again, you know, microgreens at, at this point were kind of an an un, unknown entity. I mean, there were a couple of people regionally that were that were selling those things. Um, into you know into those um, into those food co-ops up there, uh, but it wasn't saturated by any means. And and so the and, and the fact that we were certified organic um, allowed us to be able to kind of get in, get our foot in the door and, um, and and really get going. And and with the you know and with those microgreens as well, um, you know it, it was something with that heated transplant house that we had. And because the packaging of, of those is so small, I mean we're selling them in two and a half ounce clamshells. Um, and with, you know, 10 to 14 day turnaround, I mean, we could scale up really quickly. It wasn't like, you know, we were putting, uh, you know, tomatoes in the ground and, you know, and, and waiting 70 days to be able to send something out the door. I mean, we could get somebody that was interested and then, you know, 10 to 14 days have product in their, in their hand. Yeah. So, so part of what made all of the, the, I almost say monkey business work with having a third party manage your deliveries really seems like the fact that the you were dealing with a high value product. I know that was a big deal on my farm that we were doing a lot of clamshelled fresh herbs and, and fresh yeah. shallots. And that really, that really let us leverage what we were doing. Um, and, and like you say, the scaling up aspect, being able to, to quickly ramp up the production to the point where you could kind of test a market and then decide that you wanted to, to move very quickly and grow into that market. So seem like two really important factors to me for you being able to make that distribution system work. Right. Yeah, I agree. And I also know from from my own experience, like you said, you were there was one point um, several years ago now where you were actually bringing product to Rock Spring Farm. Um, Featherstone Farm was picking up your product and my product at Rock Spring Farm, driving that up to Co-op Partners Warehouse. And then I think up there it was actually getting split up and, and some of that was actually getting delivered by co-op partners warehouse out to the individual store. So there was a lot of steps in that chain to kind of pull it all together. And I know it took a lot of organization. Um, I know that was a really big deal for us was was making you got to make everything work right when you when you have somebody else doing your deliveries. You know, you can't just if you say you're going to have five boxes of stuff or you're going to be taking up two pallets worth of space or that you're going to have the product on the dock at two o'clock in the afternoon, there's not a lot of fudge factor there like there is when you're driving your own stuff to town. 
Has, was that a was that a challenge for you guys? You know, it wasn't because because again, we were working with something that was was so different from what people typically think of. You know, it's a microgreens are really formulaic, right? So I mean, we're we're starting them in a you know we're starting them in a covered space. We're you know we're planting them in you know in shallow ten twenty trays uh, with a with a potting soil, right? We we broadcast seed those. We get them up to germination. And then we come through with a with a little electric garden shears to to cut those, um, you know, triple wash them, spin them dry, put them in clamshells, and and they're ready to go. So they're not they're not super labor intensive, you know. You don't have um, you know you don't have all you, you know you're not working up fields, you know you're not going out to direct seed it. You're not sending a crew out there to um, to be able to you know to to weed those things. And, um, you know, there's just not, there's just not a, lo- a lot of those steps. And again, because you're packaging these things in such small quantities, I mean, you can take, you know, for every, for every pound of greens that, that you harvest, you've got seven units of, of sale. So, so you're working with something that has, you know, high value, um, that is in a really controlled environment. And so it, it, it's really easy to be able to kind of work through that process. So if you know the most complicated thing is getting it to, you know, getting it there on you know on time, right? That that wasn't a challenge for us. I mean, again, you know, you you've been such an enormous help for us in you know in this process as well. So when we were looking at some of those things, you know, we were able to call you up and and you said, well, I'm using you know I'm using these box you know these boxes and you know and these labels and and some of those things where you know, just by simply asking questions and talking with, you know, with you about that process that you had worked so hard to create and your willingness to share, I mean, that shortened our learning curve so significantly that, that those things didn't seem like significant hurdles for us to be able to, um, to, to kind of make that process work. It's funny you talk about those boxes, and I had, I had forgotten about that. But, you know, <laughs> we had put a lot of effort into into sizing because, OK, so we the way this worked is, that, you know, on our farm, we were we were packaging herbs into clamshells. The clamshells, we put six clamshells into a bag and sealed that bag. And then those bags of clamshells then got packed for the custom orders for the stores, you know, so we might, we might have packed 22 six count rosemary in a day to go up to the twin cities. But then, you know, four of those were going to the wedge and six of those are going to Seward and two to Mississippi market and so on. So we would then box those up according to which stores they were going to. And, and we had specifically sized these boxes to not only fit the clamshells, but also to cube on a pallet so that they would, so that they would work in this transport system. And I think that was something that you guys did when, when you came in, you were very willing to just say, well, if this is the size box that, that is being used already, we're going to fit into that so that our system fits with the rest of the system that's working. So, if, you know, if, if Rock Spring Farms putting seven boxes on and we've got two boxes that need to go on the pallet, things are all going to fit together in nice, even layers. And it's going to be something that you can really wrap and put on a truck very easily. And I think that yep. was seems to, I mean, when you when you say that, I mean, it wasn't just the process of, of you coming to me and, and me giving saying, hey, this is what we're doing and how we do it. It was that you guys were very willing to fit into the system that was already there. Right. And I, and I think that, you know, we were willing to, to adapt to that. Just, I mean, just like you said, and, you know, and, and it came down to the coating on the boxes, right? So when that goes up to co-op partners and they're breaking your, your wrapped pallet, they're not saying, oh, well, this, okay, these two boxes are different. Um, where, you know, where are these going? You know, we, we essentially, you know, just did the same thing that you were doing so that, that people didn't have to think about it and it wasn't compl- complicated. And for us on such a small scale, right? That's, that's what we needed. That's what we needed to do. We didn't want to be a hassle for anybody. We wanted to be able to, to just, to just integrate and kind of just kind of slip on in. You know, it's a lot like, you know, I listened to one of your past podcasts where you were talking about uh, the herb clamshells that you were doing as well. And one of the considerations that you had uh, when you were getting into some of these other stores is that you wanted to, you know, you chose your packaging based on what Jacob's farm was doing, right? So that if, if you, had a gap in your production or you didn't have it availability, it wasn't going to be a hassle for, for those stores that were carrying your products to be able to just to bring in something else. It was, it was fairly seamless. And that was the effort that we were, that we were really trying to, to kind of go for there. 
And at the same time too, you know, we, so at the time we were, we really had, you know, four products that we were offering. We had a, a, you know, what we were calling a tiny greens mix that was essentially, you know, a a micro green salad um, that had, you know, a, a, a yellow choy in it and a purple cabbage in it and, you know, red beets and, um, you know, green mizuna. So it was, a, you know, it was a nice kind of confetti color. We did uh, straight arugula. We did pea shoots, and um, and then we did a did micro micro kale. So we only had four different, you know, uh, unique items that that we were working with. And again, because because of the process, you know, the, the labor involved with that. I mean, we can you know we can package you know, essentially, you know, 300 to 350 units of microgreens in an hour. Um, and so, so, you know, the labor involved with being able to kind of package those up and get those ready to go isn't, you know, isn't really significant. So it was a great fit for, for us at, at the time for, you know, for a multitude of reasons. So tell me a little bit about your packaging setup then. I mean, obviously the microgreens, the way you're handling them, there's a fair amount of post-harvest handling. So you're not I, I know that some people with greens actually try to avoid washing them. And I, and I know that when, when we did microgreens on a very small scale for the CSA, we actually didn't wash them. Uh, it was one of the few things on my farm that didn't get washed. Uh, what, what kind of a packaging setup do you guys have? And, and tell me about your process for that. So essentially, if I just kind of walk through the, through that, that post-harvest product, or the, from harvest to, to out the door process, um, you know, so say we have, you know, uh, 200, you know, 250 trays that, you know, that, that we're going through for, for a harvest. Um, you know, originally what we did is we would go through and we would, we would cut those, you know, by hand with the scissors and, um, and we could keep that, we could keep those greens pretty clean during that process. Um, and, and, and then could have probably run a system much like what you're talking about, where you're not even washing those and, and you're just packaging them. But, um, the bottleneck, as we started to this, scale this up, um, one of, I guess, one of the bottlenecks was, uh, was that, was the harvesting. And, you know, we're lucky enough to have, uh, a, a, you know, what I would call a, a great friend now, uh, his name is Eric Franks and he lives out in Pennsylvania that that's growing microgreens on a, on a really significant scale in comparison to, to what we're doing. And he started doing it years before us. So, um, as you know, we started t- kind of, you know, talking to him and said, yeah, you know, it's starting to take me a really long time to be able to, you know, to harvest, you know, with these scissors. And he said, Oh, well, I'm, I'm using one of these little electric, uh, you know, shears now to be able to cut through, to be able to cut through things. And man, it's an incredible time saving thing. So, I mean, we were able to, you know, what was taking us at that point, then maybe, you know, maybe three hours or three and a half hours to harvest. All of a sudden we were able to get that done, um, you know, in a, in an hour's time. You know, the drawback with that was that we weren't able to keep those greens as clean, right? So what I'm doing is, is I've got, um, you know, a, a, mili- a mini pallet that you talked about in a previous podcast as well um, with somebody. I saw that you had uh, you had put a picture up of that, but a mini pallet that sits on the ground. We've got a harvest bin that sits on top of that pallet. And then what I do is I hold that 1020 tray at a 45-degree angle in my hand, and then with three passes, I can come through with that shears and, and cut that tray. And it's really, you know, it's really quick, quick. I can just kind of whiz through those, but I do then get more debris from the surface of that, uh, of that soil that then, uh, inevitably drops into, into that harvest bin as well. So, so I have to, so I have to wash them, right. To, to get them clean. Right. We were at a place where the potting soil that we brought in was at the time had, um, you know, perlite particles in it. Right. And that was um, another thing that we've now kind of been able to to kind of work away from. But um, but we so we had to kind of go through that process. So we've got uh, we've got a triple basin sink that we're able to go through and we would just do, you know, three dunks. We put it in the first one, we drop it to the second, then drop it to the third. And then and then from there, we pull it out and we've got a 20 gallon um, commercial salad spinner. that, that we're able to put it in and, you know, drop those greens. We can put about 15 pounds worth of microgreens in, in there at a time. And we spin that for, for five minutes. And then that comes out, uh, into, into bulk bags. And then that goes into the, into the cooler. Um, and then, you know, depending on, on the day, and that's going to typically sit in there for, you know, for maybe, 
you know, 12 to, you know, 12 to 24 hours in the, in the cooler to kind of bring that, the temperature of those things down. And then we'll come back, package that, and then, you know, package and box, um, and send it out the, and send it out the door. And how many times a week are you doing that? We're doing that twice a week. And where is that facility located? I mean, it's on your farm. Is it, is it, uh, do you guys have a, pa- a separate packing shed built for that? So right now what we're doing is, um, in our, so we've got a 30 foot by 96 foot transplant greenhouse that, and again, we moved to this farm about two years ago and realizing, uh, through past experience that, uh, you know, that, that things change fairly, fairly rapidly when, um, when you're just getting oriented to a, to a new space, we, you know, we forewent trying to do anything with, a you know, a, you know, a new packing shed or processing area at, at the time, um, and kind of used, you know, used the space that we had. So we, you know, we were going to, we, we trenched water, um, into, you know, into that transplant house. We brought electric into that transplant house. It was a space that, you know, that, oh, that had the capacity to, to be able to heat. Um, you know, we could get the, the, you know, the drainage that we needed. So we put up those, the sinks and the salad spinner is in a, tucked in a corner of, of that transplant house. That's, not more than uh, than you know 250 feet from from the house, and then um, in the basement of the house, um, there's a room that has a, a concrete floor with a floor drain, um, and um, you know and electric. So we had the capacity to be able to to put refrigeration in there as well. So for for at least the microgreens part of it, we've got um, you know stainless steel tables set up in there. We've got a, a dual door. Um, refri- commercial refrigerator that we're using, and so we take the greens in into the basement of the house, into that that processing area to do all the all the packaging um, and and refrigeration. Now you know now that we've been here two years, um, our our seedling sales have grown significantly. Um, you know we've realized the limitations of. Uh, you know, of, of that separation of those things, right? So having to, you know, to, to wash greens in one place and then walk them, you know, walk them to another place and go in a, you know, a, a 36 inch wide door and down a couple of stairs to be able to do that packaging. And then, you know, all of that movement has kind of become inefficient for us. And so, you know, right now we're in, we're in the process of working through the designs where hopefully by, you know, by midsummer this year, we'll have, uh, we'll have a, uh, a kind of central packing, you know, washing and packing station where everything is in one one location that we can do that will be that will not be in a greenhouse, but will be a, in a covered lean-to off the back of a, an existing building. I think you said that moving on to the new farm really helped you guys to understand what you needed right from the start, or at least where we wanted to, to start at that point and what we needed to have have in place. Um, you know, we had gone through you know through you know many many evolutions uh, on. Uh, on our old property, uh, you know, an example would be, uh, you know, the the transplant house that we started with, right? So, um, you know, that first season we put up a, a 22 foot wide by 48 foot, you know, heated space with with benches in there, um, you know, and and that first season we were at about in the spring at least we were about 80 80 percent capacity because we were doing some custom plant sales for for home gardeners um, and some and some local growers. And you know, and our own stuff in microgreens. So that was that was fairly full. We said, okay, you know, we we you know, we're all right. We can we've got a little bit of space to be able to grow. And then people heard what we were doing, and uh, you know, and 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 so then we had more orders that next year. And so by you know by the second season, that space was too small. So we tore that building down. We sold it. We were able to buy a used building from somebody else, and we put up a you know a thirty by you know thirty by sixty six foot transplant space. We were like, okay, yeah, this gets us a square footage, should work with where we're at. Then again, we were at another place where, uh, you know, within, within, actually within that next season, that space was full. So then we added, you know, then we added on, you know, a little bit, you know, we added on 12, 12 more feet because we had those hoops. We just didn't think that we needed them right away. We were doing these kind of things incrementally. And, and so I think we were at a, we were at a place where we were like, all right, let's just over, you know, let's oversize everything. And, um, you know, and that will, when we move to this new location, that will give us about two years to kind of figure out what we need. And at that point we should be in a place where, 
um, you know, where we have the working capital to be able to um, to invest in a in a structure like that. And and here we are. We're you know we're at, we're at two years into this new location. We um, you know we're ready for a pro- we're for a for a you know separate kind of consolidated packing washing and packing area. And you know and 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 the, and the sales of of our seedlings, our on farm seedlings, and the microgreens have grown to an extent where we really just can't afford to have anything in here other than plants. And in fact, this, uh, this late spring, early summer, we'll be putting up a, another 30 by 96 foot transplant house, um, to be able to take on the contract, uh, the contracted seedling sales that we have planned for 2017. It's kind of fun to see that kind of demand for your product and, and that, that growth. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's funny. It's kind of like if you build it, they will come kind of a thing. I mean, we've just, we've been around a lot, you know, long enough. I think we've really focused focused on consistency and quality and and just you know and just trying to kind of create the system and the process so that things can run smoothly um and and that has you know that has allowed this kind of uh, exponential growth for us to really really be able to happen. How long have you and Katie been full time on the farm? Uh, gosh, it would have been october uh October two thousand and fourteen. So not, not very long. You spent a long time making sure you had other sources of income while you were building up the river root farm uh, infrastructure and the, and the business really, so that you didn't have to have that pressure of, we have to produce. You were really able to focus on your productive capacity. Yep. Yeah. Through, through four season tools, I had, you know, I had a primary focus, so I was really limited in, in my involvement with, you know, with the farm and, and Katie, you know, Katie was the one who spearheaded that along with, um, you know, the, the, the most incredible first employee we could have ever possibly dreamed for, um, that, that really allowed us to, to kind of be able to get this thing, you know, up, up and off the ground. You had, and Colin Thompson worked with us for, for several years and you've had him on, you had him on the podcast too. He's up at, uh, Michigan State's, uh, UPREC farm up in the upper peninsula, but he really helped get this thing off the ground too. But we were also in a place where we, we really didn't need to, to draw, you know, we weren't trying to draw any income from the farm, right? We were, we were taken care of with, you know, with my, with my off farm job, so to speak. And so what that really allowed us to be able to do was position ourselves for the first five years to be able to take any of the revenue that we, that we were generating on farm and just dump it right back into the infrastructure, right in, right into the farm. And that was in the form of, you know, in the, in the form of high tunnels, um, you know, essentially, you know, essentially high tunnels and, and labor to be able to kind of get this, get this thing going. So that was, you know, that was something that allowed us, um, the, the ability and, and something that I'm really thankful for. I mean, it would have been, uh, you know, especially based on our location, as we kind of talked about a little bit, it would have been a real challenge to try to, to try to make a living from the farm. Um, you know, I, I think in that, you know, anytime in that first five years. Now, again, we weren't in a place where, where we had the kind of pressure to, to make it work, but because of the small community, the time that we, that we thought it was going to take to be able to, to identify what those, those niches and opportunities were for us, we just needed that time uh, in the community that we were in to be able to, to kind of identify where, you know, where the farm was going to go. I mean, that was, that's the other thing really for us is that we didn't, we didn't necessarily, I mean, we had a thing, we had things that, that we were interested in doing, right. Or we had this kind of vision for, for what, you know, the, the farm could look like, right. Based on, you know, working with Elliot and Barbara and, you know, diversified vegetables, the wholesale markets and just some retail outlets, but we weren't really tied to that. Um, we were willing and ready to be able to be fluid and to adapt and continue to, to, to be able to keep our eyes open and, and, and adapt to, to changing things as well, to be able to say, well, what, what direction does this community in our region need this farm to go? And, 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 and it, so, so that, you know, again, we just, we took the time to be able to do that, I guess. Um, we didn't, you know, we also didn't want to be in a place where, you know, being the, you know, the, the new, the new kid on the block uh, in a, in a community with lots of small farms, you know, standing shoulder to shoulder with somebody that's been at the farmer's market for 15 years, right? Trying to say, oh, buy our carrots, not your carrots, you know, buy our tomatoes, not, you know, not their tomatoes, right? And, and so we were, we were looking at ways to be able to kind of fill in the holes and, um, and just hope that with, with attention to those things that, that this thing could really take off. And, and, it, and it has. 
That's really great, Mike. We're going to take a break here and get a word from our sponsors. And then when we come back, I want to talk some more about uh, winter production because that was certainly one of the niches that you guys occupied. And then and then the, the seedling sales and how that works on your farm. Sounds good. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. When you buy potting mix from Vermont Compost Company, you're not just buying an input. You're joining a community of growers across the United States. And like the best inputs and the best communities, you're getting a product and a community that really have your back. Vermont Compost Company has been committed to helping farmers make money by growing great transplants for over 20 years. If you've got questions or need help with your transplants, whether you've got questions about watering, temperatures, troubleshooting, growing conundrums, you can call them up and you can actually talk to Carl Hammer, the founder and owner of the company. And Carl knows his stuff. And about that community, Vermont Compost keeps track of who gets every batch of potting soil they create. And because Vermont Compost deals directly with growers without going through a distributor, they know who's using their potting soils and how they're using them. Vermont Compost Company knows, like I do, that organic growers are some of the best people on the planet. They're proud to be part of that community. Taking care of growers by taking care of transplants since 1992. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Audible, where you can get a free audiobook when you sign up for a free 30-day trial at audibletrial.com slash farmer to farmer. I've been a fan of spoken word media for as long as I can remember. I just love listening to ideas and stories, and I love the fact that I can listen while I'm getting something physical done. I've spent years of tractor time plugged into selections from Audible when I couldn't always make the time to read, and I love listening while I'm on the road regardless of whether I'm doing deliveries or driving to visit a client. And it's so easy now that you probably carry an iDevice or Android with you just about everywhere you go. Audible has over 100,000 titles that you can choose from. I usually go for long ones, but I want to mention one short and powerful title that you can get for free with your trial. The One Minute Manager provides a suite of incredibly powerful personnel management tools that you can put to use right away on your farm. While the story it tells is based in the office, the tools for setting expectations praising and reprimanding are right on in any setting just go to audibletrial.com slash farmer to farmer to get your free audiobook download all right and we're back with mike bollinger from river root farm in decorah iowa mike we said before the break that we wanted to to dig into the winter production that you're doing i i you know i have a question first before we before we go down that road because you're doing so many different things you've got the winter production you've got the microgreens you've got the markets in in the twin cities markets in lacrosse rochester um and then in in there in decora um you talked about doing seed production. You've got the transplant production. I mean, there's a lot of different things going on on your farm. How much production are we talking overall, if you don't mind giving us a sense of those gross sales numbers? You know what, Chris? I wish I could give you those uh, those specifically. Um, lucky for me, I'm not the one who has to handle all of our all of our books. Um, Katie does that. I would say gross sales were probably sitting at, at about that 160,000 mark. Um, okay. And, uh, and, and so that's where we're at, but we're, we're in a place where I think that that's going to, that's going to expand pretty rapidly with some of the things that, that we have coming on, coming online. But, um, I think that's, we were at about two years ago, we were at about a hundred and 120,000. And I think we had, you know, again, our, our high tunnel spaces. And then we had about a little over an acre of, you know, acre of, well, acre and a half of, of outdoor production that's expanded some. Um, so that bumped us up to that to that 160, and, and now we're gonna this next year, well this this season we're coming on with uh, with some new clamshell salad greens that we trialed out last season, which I think will will be a pretty significant bump. Um, we're we're finding that there's now um, now an opening for clamshell herbs again, so we've put put plants in to be able to start doing some of that clamshell package stuff. Lots of packaged greens and herbs is kind of where we're going, and then as I mentioned before. Um, we uh, were expanding that transplant sales. So we've got a, a new client coming online that, um, that we're going to be selling for um, in, in addition to the plant sales that we're already doing. Um, there we're contract growing about 70,000 70, plants um, for them uh, starting in 2017. Moving forward, that's a, that's a multi-year uh, project as long as we hold up our end of the bargain. Wow, that's huge. Now you said you've actually got a contract for that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in in the loosest sense of the, of the term, I mean, it's um, it's something that I mean, we've worked out the details of growing from there. We don't have we don't have a signed you know signed contract for a certain number of years or whatever. But we've been you know we've been working with them 
uh, for the last five years selling plants for them, and now we're just taking on another another portion of the sales that uh, of the seedling sales that that they're already doing. Um, they've had somebody else growing those for them that that's retiring, and and we're kind of stepping into that. So it's something you really can feel comfortable doing because you're because you've got that that depth of relationship with them that you can go out and build another greenhouse yep. for doing producing that additional seventy thousand units because you already know that this this customer's worth is worth it. Yeah, we've been you know we've been working with them uh, for for about five years already, and 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 the portion that we're taking on the online plant sales that they've been doing, I think. Gosh, I want to say they've been doing it for for you know fifteen years at, at least. So this is a, an established uh, and, and kind of known entity that that really has you know good you know has really identified you know what that what that demand is and um, yeah so so we're good to go. So you do the transplants for them. You also do transplants that you sell locally. I know at least at the Oneota Food Co-op. Are you selling those anywhere else? Uh, the only other place so. Um, Gardens of Egan had been doing a lot of transplants up in the up in the Northfield area that they've been sending out to to folks, and um, and when 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 they closed down this this past fall, um, we got we got a call from a couple of places, but with the the space that we that we already have, the only thing that we took on was uh, the Rochester Food Co-op. Um, is this is really the second year that second or third year that that they're selling some plants. Uh, on a on a on a fairly small scale, um, but we'll be we'll be bringing plants up there as well. So really, our plant sales now are um, through you know the only other food co-op through Seed Savers Exchange. We handle all of their uh, the plants that they sell through their visitors center, um, uh, and then and Rochester. So those they sell three Rochester, Oneota, and Seed Savers. Okay, and. Can you tell us a little bit about how that whole process works? Because that's got to be something that that doesn't really fit in with the microgreens. At least, I mean, I, I'm thinking particularly from a from a marketing standpoint. I mean, you know, do, are you are you shipping those through the same distribution channels to get those up to Rochester, or is this something where you're you're actually having to dig in and be a little bit more involved and hands on with? Yeah. So so this so this kind of you know the Rochester. Um, arrangement. Uh, this is the this is the first time that we're going to do that. So that we didn't do that last year. Um, they kind of approached us um, only a, a handful of weeks ago, and we kind of just said, "Yeah, why not? Let's do it. Uh, we'll we'll work it out." But we're we're not going to be able to send plants through that way. We've got a um, we've got a ten foot enclosed trailer um, with shelving built into it. We can fit about a hundred and ten. Uh, tra- uh, flats worth of plants in there at any time, which is which is totally adequate for for their weekly quantities. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna drive those up there. We'll essentially we'll have an, an employee drive uh, drive those things up there. Um, we, we haven't worked it out the, the, the details yet, um, but we at, at most we would have to deliver those once once a week for five weeks. So it's a pretty short window. Um, but we may be in a place where where we are able to do it every every two weeks. Um, we're seeing if we can make that work. But worst case scenario, we we deliver once a week for five weeks. Okay, and and are, so you must be with the, with those succession cropping things to have those transplants available over a long period of time, right? So you're not just growing one crop of tomatoes to that then you're selling over that five week peri- that five week period. You're you're putting in multiple crops, right? Yeah, we're putting in in multiple multiple plantings. So, um, I was I was looking at things with Katie uh, yesterday when we were in the greenhouse, and just I was asking, you know, Katie is really the one who's. I mean, this is all in, in her you know her spreadsheets and her brain. I mean, she's uh, I mean she's she's incredible, and and we wouldn't be where we're at without you know without her. Um, but she's you know she's really got a talent for for this, and this has kind of been her baby. I mean, when we when we started. Doing transplants um, in in 2010, um, you know the the first the you know all we were selling to to seed savers at the time was five flats of basil, and and the reason that this plant sale thing even really started is knowing that we weren't gonna you know we weren't gonna do farmers market we weren't gonna do a CSA we were looking for ways to be able to generate income for the farm in in the spring. Right, so we didn't want to be in a place where we were planting field crops 
in, you know, starting in April and waiting until June to be able to see that, that first source of revenue coming in. So, and, and because of the infrastructure that we were putting in that heated transplant house and, and with the, the unheated high tunnels, you know, we wanted to fill those things up. So, so we were doing everything we could to kind of, to kind of fill, you know, fill that heated transplant space to start. So we actually started out when we just got into it, we're saying, well, there, you know, there's such an, an avid, uh, you know, collection of, of home gardeners and homesteaders and small acreage growers around here. You know, we wonder if we could, you know, we could tap into that a little bit. So we, in that first year, we said, all right, we're going to do this kind of, uh, you know, subscription plant sale kind of a thing, right? Where people would just like a, like a CSA, they would prepay for their plants. They would, they would order the quantities that they would want. And then we would grow, we would grow those out. And then, and then people could come to the farm and pick those up. And with the fact that people were prepaying for those, that was that early source of income, along with the microgreens and along with the high tunnel production that, that we were doing, that allowed us to be able to get that influx of cash early on that we were looking for. And that has just kind of continued to grow for us. And again, because we're not really interested in the CSA model, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to, um, we want lim- to, you know, limit our our crossover with you know with other growers here that are in the farmers market because of the um, the you know the limited capacity of the community to purchase those things that we just continue to to drive um, you know, the plant sales and the microgreens to a point where essentially in you know, the plant sales that we're doing now would be the equivalent of uh, you know a seven you know seventy to eighty member CSA right over the course of a CSA being twenty weeks that we can you know we get that that income. In, in the first, you know, in, in five weeks. And there we have different financial arrangements with, with those different places. But, you know, by, you know, we're done by the first week of June. And so we have, you know, we have that, you know, that, that, that cash flow coming in right from the very beginning. And, um, you know, and the micro, and, and, and again with the microgreens too, right? So um, the, the arrangements that we have, we worked a couple of different ways, right? So with, with Seed Savers Exchange, the way that we've been able to work that out is that we do the, the first delivery to them comes uh, the second or third week of April. And they, and they pay us in full for, for that, you know, for everything that we're growing out for them uh, upon first delivery. So that's a really nice kind of chunk that we get at the at, at, Nice big fact check at the beginning that uh, you know that we can that we can kind of depend on. And again, you know, we're moving through, you know, about you know, so starting the we shut microgreens down the you know at, at Christmas, and then we start back up. So we're selling those things um, the the first week of the you know the first week of March, and that's about you know fifteen hundred dollars gross revenue a, a week. So we do have you know we do have some of that kind of kind of coming in early on. But but that's been a really nice way for us then to to kind of figure out how to, you know, how to have, how, how to have money coming in, um, in that, in that early season for us. So I, I don't think it's really, it's not outside the box or it doesn't, I don't feel like it conflicts with the microgreens or the other things that we do, that we're doing. It's a very significant, um, part of our business and we're happy to really be able to, um, to, to expand that again, because it's, um, you know, the, you know, the margins on that are, are, are really good and it's very formulaic. Right. It's, it's, we can, we've created a process. We've created a system, right. We know, we know when to, you know, when we have to plant all those things. Right. And so, you know, tomatoes, you know, when, when with the, with those first deliveries that's going out, you know, they're, they're five weeks old. And with the, you know, with the third delivery that's going out, they're only about four weeks old. And by, because we're getting, you know, increasing heat, increasing day length for that photo period, Right, the the last ones that were going out are only about three and a half weeks old. So we've had to work that system out. But again, it's very easy for us to, to be able to work in this controlled environment where we know what to expect and and we can you know and we and, and, and there, you know, we can control those variables. So so we really like we really like it. Your transplant house, is there anything special that you're doing in there or is it just your is it a standard what we would normally expect to find on an upper Midwest organic vegetable farm transplant house, you know, benches, uh, forced air LP heat and, uh, and hand watering, or have you, have yeah. you done anything fancier than that? Well, you know, chickweed growing through the gravel on the floor, dandelions coming yeah. up that our kids can play with. Yeah. You know, we've got all the bells and whistles in, in this place. All right. Um, yeah, you know, it is, it is really very, you know, very standard. So, um, you know, 30 by 30 by 96, 
we've got um, you know six foot tall side walls. Uh, we've got metal end walls with polycarbonate. We've got roll up sides and and manual peak vents. We've got two 20 inch fans that push air uh, around. We've got a um, we've got an LB white uh, heater that, that heats that space. Um, and we've got we've got a, a trolley um, system in here that allows us to be able to move plants uh, around the greenhouse, and um, and we've got a, a bought-in germination chamber. So and 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 some of those things are just as you know we didn't start with all of those things, but as we identified the bottlenecks that we were having, um, we were able to very quickly invest in in those systems. And ha- having had the experience through Four Season Tools to be able to you know, walk on to lots of farms and sea farms and talk through, you know, the, through those initial startup phase of things with people. You know, we knew that there would be a point where we could invest in these things and we had been, you know, figured out where, where to kind of source them. So when, when, it was, when it was time to invest in those things, we could hit, you know, hit the go button and, and really go. Um, you know, one of the things, so there are, you know, a few things that, that we've identified with, this, with the seedling sales that, um, you know, that have, that have made our, our lives easier. Um, or that we've had to deal with as as we've kind of had the you know had the, the growth from from year to year. We used to be in a place where um, where we would germinate everything on on the tabletops, right? So we'd we'd fill a set of you know we'd fill a set of four packs, um, and you know put the soil put the soil in, you know drop the seeds in, cover it with a little bit of vermiculite, and then just water and just water those in on the tabletops, but. That's not a very efficient use of that space to be able to, to, to be germinating those things where you're getting you're getting full light where you should have where you should have you know plants growing, and um, and so as we've had a demand for for space and really tried to push the efficiencies of this space, you know we we no longer germinate anything on on the tabletop. Um, we we've taken some just like standard plant racks. And we actually use for for our plant sales, um, and we've loaded those up with shelves. So um, what are they about? Uh, they fit five, five, ten, twenties across across a shelf, and then we've layered that in so that we could put fifty, ten, twenty trays on a rack, right? And we've got right now we've got four of those up. So what we, now what we do is we fill those trays. You know, we drop the seeds in, we cover it, we water it. And then they, those go into those stand-up layered shelves, and we wrap those in uh, in old greenhouse plastic and, and to, to trap the moisture in. So essentially, it's a it's the lowest tech version of a germination chamber that you can get. And all, but all we're really trying to do is retain that moisture. So there's a little bit of residual heat gain because that's clear plastic, and so it keeps it really nice and warm, at least on you know on fairly sun, sunny days or even on mostly cloudy days. We get enough heat in there that those germinate really well, and it holds that humidity in there. So we get good germination, and we're not having to take up tabletop space to be able to do that. And we're actually doing that with all of our all of our microgreens too. So that's been a really a, a thing that we've kind of had to work out that saved us quite a you know quite a bit of space. And then as well, you know, we were in a place where when we first started out, and you you were doing some research paper for Iowa State years ago, where you're looking at transplant systems, and you came out when we were just going, and I think we had you know two two heat mats sitting on a little wooden table, and we had these little wire wickets sitting over top yeah. of them and we draped the fabric over those and you know and, and away we went with the uh, with with germination and that worked on a on a fairly small scale i think we were running um you know four heat maps at the kind of peak of that but what we found with with the heat map as we tried to scale up was that there was quite a bit of variability in that right so because you're you're providing dry you know dry heat from the from the bottom and you need to retain moisture to be able to get those things to germinate, you know, we'd come through, we'd uncover them, you know, we'd you know, use the fog at nozzle to really miss, you know, miss those things so not to displace the seeds, you know, and then cover them back up. And we were always doing this thing. It was like, you know, competing forces, you know, dry heat and water on top. And as we tried to scale that up, we found that we were getting a lot of uh, dampening problems, really poor, really poor germination. Um, and, and we decided to invest in a, in a germination chamber now that, Allows us, you know, greater productivity, but does a wonderful job. It allows us to be able to put about we. So we've kind of moved. We were doing soil blocks on a fairly significant scale, um, and have since kind of moved away from that um, a little bit. But we're still using those the mini block soil maker to be able to, um, which is like a three quarter inch cube, 
to be able to do all of our all of our germinating that goes into those. And we like those because we don't have to have a plug popper uh, um, or anything like that where we're handling those really small plants, especially with um, some of the, the herbs and the cut flowers that we're doing from seed that are just so, I mean, you can't even hardly see them. I can't believe Katie can actually see those things when she's seeding them in, but they're really flat, fragile. And so they peel apart really easy and it's really quick to kind of plunk all those things. So the most things get, get started in those soil blocks into a germination chamber. And the one that we, that we chose was from a, um, just to throw this out there, was a company called Phytotronics, um, is in a, based out of Missouri. And the reason that we chose that one specifically um, was because it has, so it's got a, you know, water basin in the bottom, and it's got, um, you know, the heating element in it, and it's got a float valve in there with, um, to, to be able to turn that heat off if that water gets low, which is something that you had gotten one from a, a Carolina greenhouses um, yeah. out on the East Coast that, that, we, that we saw, and that was one of the things that you brought up was trying to put that water in, and is it running out, or you know that, that you don't want to burn that bottom pan out because that's the that's the kind of uniqueness of those of those chambers. But what they had is an autofill, so we can just hook our hose up to that germination chamber, and it and it just kind of is a self-functioning unit. So we don't really have to to think about it. I mean, in the evening before we when we're closing things up and we go in, you know, I, I, I look on the outside. There's a series of lights so that I know that it's functioning, um, but it can kind of just kind of run run itself, and, and we've enjoyed that immensely. And it's pretty much alleviated that those competing forces of the dry and the wet, um, and and our germination quality improved significantly. Um, and when you're dealing with you know with seeds that are coming from you know the, the heirloom seeds that that do have the ability to to vary in not only the quality of their germination of just the total number of of plants that you get for the seeds that you plant, but also in the timing. Um, you know, the, it's, it's allowed us to be able to kind of find that, that happy medium there where I think we're, we're doing the, the, we're making the best effort to, um, to, to get quality germination that's fairly uniform time. Um, and that, and that chamber helps us do that. That's some really great insights into how that whole, that whole transplant production for retail sales process works. And I think some great hints about doing the, just doing the transplant production in general. I kind of wish we'd done that back in February when there was still time to get a germination chamber before you needed it for this year, but there's always next year. There's always always next year. Hey, actually, and if I, if I can just interject, um, just a, uh, a couple, a couple of other things or one other thing that, that I really like about, um, what we've set up. For, for these green, greenhouses are um, what at Four Season Tools we refer to as integrated integrated benches. So the the, the toughest place to really you know when you're looking at, at bench tops you know how you lay that structure out and and you know building tables um, is that we um, we figured out or designed a system where we tied in the benches to the sidewall hoops. Um, so we use the same greenhouse pipe material and, and it looks like, you know, bracing and we've got four foot tables on, on either side of the structure that tie into those vertical sidewalls. So it allows us to really abut right up, uh, to the, to the edge of the greenhouse in a really nice way. And, um, you, I can, I'll send you a photo maybe that you can post up there too, for people to be able to see that. Um, yeah, but that it's one of those great. places that can kind of be a, a challenge to, to fit tables up along that side. And I think with the materials that you're using, it's a really, you know, really efficient use, use of tools that can keep that, that bench, uh, the bench tops really kind of really close and, and tied into to that structure. I've even seen people now that are trying to, to double up their spaces as, as transplants um, that are heavy on the, on the early season. And then as they, as they move out of spring, they have less transplants that are going out or that, that, that they're growing. And so maybe they're trying to, to utilize that greenhouse space for in-ground growing too. So I've seen people now that are designing these systems so that those sidewall benches actually fold up so that you could have growing spaces underneath them too and gives you more access. Very slick. Yeah. Very slick. So, so yeah, so that's a question I got about these, about these transplant houses and the transplant production. What are you doing with the space in the rest of the year? Well, um, that's, that's a, it's an ongoing process for us. Um, at this point, what we've done, so, so again, like I said, we're, we're done with, um, you know, we're done with the transplant sales by, by early June. Then all of a sudden we have this nearly 3000 square foot greenhouse that we're only growing, that we're only growing microgreens in. 
Um, and so we're not utilizing that space very well. Um, so, but we've got, again, keeping our ears open, we've, we've kind of used it as an experiment, experimentation place for us um, to think about how we could extend um, you know, our green seasons or, or open up um, new markets with herbs in this space. So um, instead of, so a couple of years ago, uh, we started thinking about, um, about clamshell herb production and we weren't necessarily because we had just moved to this new space and we didn't have the ground worked up and we had other things going on. Um, we weren't ready to, to, to plunk herbs in the ground and dedicate to, to that kind of full on. So we used three gallon pots and we plunked herbs in, in three gallon pots and just spread those out over the benches um, to be able to, to allow us to be able to, again, have controlled production. We're not having to go out and cultivate. Um, you know, we can, we can water in a confined space pretty, you know, pretty easily. We had water and things here already and allowed us to be able to locally try out clamshell products, um, you know, growing different things. What's the, you know, what's the demand, what's the packaging look at, look like, and, and kind of test that market a little bit. Um, we've also got friends that are in the Chicago area that are actually growing salad greens like they would microgreens. They're just spacing them out a little farther and um and growing like lettuces and things like that that they're then cutting in a similar way with scissors or with shears and and selling that like they would salad um you know we we did the math on that and we you know we're not in a place where we're trying to get a premium market or a price for for those products we're not i mean we can't get 10 or 12 dollars a pound for those things so we can't necessarily justify growing salad greens but we played around with that a little bit just to see what that would kind of look like and um, and so then the other, so then once fall hits, um, we do use that space. We put a shade cloth over, um, over half the structure and we, um, 90% shade cloth. And we use that to cure our garlic and, and onions and things like that. So we use that as a, as a drying space. Um, and, and that's worked out for us fairly well. Now we're kind of shifting back away from garlic and, and cutting back on onions uh, a little bit. And, and what I'm actually thinking about now is especially now since we're looking at putting up another um, 30 by 96 foot transplant houses, and again, so with nearly, uh, you know, nearly 6,000 square feet of space um, that we're only using from, you know, mid-February through the first week of June, what I'm thinking about doing is building raised beds underneath, um, underneath all of the all of the benches that I have. And because we're growing microgreens on such a significant scale, we're able to take, we, we can take all of that soil, you know, let, uh, and, and use that to fill beds that we could grow underneath. And we probably won't do it during the summer, but we could use that space to be able to grow, uh, grow salad greens under, underneath the benches. And because those benches aren't, go, aren't going to be filled during that time of year, we won't move benches out and things like that, but there's, there'll be enough residual light if we hit the timing right of when we direct seed those that we could grow, um, that we could grow plants in uh, in those in those raised beds in the fall, and then when we shut that greenhouse off in uh, in January, then we just let all you know just let the frost come in and kind of harden all harden all of that, and then probably what we would do in the spring is just is just cover that with some sort of fabric or greenhouse plastic um, in the in the spring, so that we're not having you know, residual pest issues or, or anything like that. And if there's anybody that's doing this that wants to reach out uh, to me or, or post something on your podcast page or something like that, what we're thinking about on our, uh, in our new transplant house is, is actually foregoing benches and actually just building raised beds in those, um, probably only like 10 inches tall or something like that, um, filling that with filling that with material so we can do that same kind of thing. But then when it's transplant season, what we would do, because we're bringing so much potting soil in too, we just have this, an immense amount of pallets that we would just line the surface or cover the surface of those raised beds with pallets to be able to be, to, to use those as our, as our benches for that transplant season and, and kind of go that way. I love that creative use of the of that covered space, really being deliberate about finding ways to make that work for you. So then the other the other big thing that you're doing inside of the structures is the is the winter production. You've got the the microgreens, the transplants, and then you've got also just doing in ground what I would think of as Elliot Coleman style winter production, right? Yeah, so so what we have right now in the in the backfield for for covered space is uh, we've got two 
two high tunnels that are stationary that are 30 feet wide and 144 feet long. And then we've got three buildings that are 30 feet wide by 48 feet long. And those are, uh, two of those are on, uh, on V-Track, which is a, a mobile system. Um, and, and another one is, on, and the third one is on a, on a pipe skit. So the, the two V-Track systems that we have uh, have the ability to rotate between two positions, and the pipe skid version that we have, we can re- we can rotate between three plots. Now we have we have it laid out, uh, those beds laid out, so that we could actually expand uh, those V track tunnels to be able to cover four plots if we wanted to add the track, and we and we could move that pipe skid tunnel to a to a fourth position too. Uh, but we're just at a place yet where uh, where where we really have identified that as as something to to put energy into. So so we're kind of we're kind of riding that riding those out for now, and and realize that what we needed to do was we needed to, to increase production, um, which is why the last two buildings that we had that we put up um, have been those larger stationary buildings. Are there different crops that you're growing in the stationary buildings than what you're growing in the mobile tunnels? Um. Yeah, so so we 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 have built a, a way to be able to kind of rotate those through. Maybe the um, the easiest way to kind of talk about it is um, is is just to tell you kind of what we're doing what we're doing this year. Um, maybe maybe that makes the most sense, and, and maybe that'll answer the question just by uh, just by kind of talking about it. Um, That'd be awesome. So in um, so the way that we structured it is is this year because we're in a place where we've got so much going on. With um, with the plant sale, that we we kind of have tried to hit a, a sweet spot for for timing or the best sweet spot we can with timing for those plants. So um, you know a lot of people are are when they're looking at that really early season production now are are looking at um, you know starting transplants of things in a heated space in like January, and then um, and then trans and then transplanting that stuff out in in February to get early early product going, or they're really pushing um, or they're really pushing German or direct seeding crops in that in in early February. We've pushed we've pushed that back a little bit just by the realities of what we have going on. So the way that we're that we're planting crops now um, is that we plant on. Um, Typically somewhere in the in the last week of February, and then we plant on. I remember we're doing the the fifth of March, the tenth of March, the twentieth of March, and then and then that next planting would be as early as we could get it going out out in the field, and and those are with with salad crops. So I mentioned one of the things that we're really trying to do is is focus on um, on on greens production, and we're moving into these five ounce clam shells shells of greens. Um, we started doing that that last last fall, um, typically or really because I, I really like growing salad greens. I, it's something that you know people love to consume. Uh, it's something that does really well in um, you know in, in our in our community, and it, but it also does well, I guess, in the in in those tunnel spaces in the off season. But what we found is there there are a lot of people growing salad greens also, right? Or spinach, or arugula, and baby kale, and lettuce mixes, and you know Asian greens to blend in, and things like that. So we we have found that we can't really expand that market um, like we would want to doing um, doing bulk greens, right? Or, or trying to put those things in in bags, um, right? But but there isn't anybody that there hasn't been anybody doing that on a scale. Um, with with the five ounce clamshells, so you could walk into any grocery store or any food co-op. Doesn't doesn't matter what time of year it is, and you're always going to see California product in those clamshells, right? And they're going to carry, uh, you know, they're going to probably carry a baby kale. They're going to carry a salad blend. They're going to carry uh, some of them. I think uh, I don't remember if it's maybe it's Earthbound and Taylor carry a 50-50 mix, which is half salad, half spinach, and then they're yep. going to do and they do their version of like. How they, some of them call them power greens or wellness blend or whatever. And essentially what that is, is a, is a mescaline mix. It's a non lettuce salad blend. That's got kale and, uh, you know, radicchio and chard and, um, things like that in it. Um, and, and so we tested that out last fall for about 10 weeks and, and the, and people were just so stoked about it. They were just, um, happy to get their hands on it, 
happy that, you know, the, you know, what we, you know, the, the, our, our customers who are really those produce managers, right. Are so excited to have somebody that's coming in the door saying, that's not saying, Hey, I want to sell you, you know, can I sell you cherry tomatoes, which everybody's growing or slicer tomatoes or, you know, all these things where the market is already saturated and they're having to say, you know, no, we've already, you know, we've already got those things. We're trying to come at it with a different plant saying, what don't they have? What can we do to make their life easier for those places to be able to, to bring a product in and increase their local or regional sales base with something that they're not already doing. So we're, so we're now, doing six different products. We're doing the baby arugula, baby kale, uh, uh, a lettuce mix, the 50-50 mix, and, and, a, and a mescaline blend that we're calling Mighty Greens, um, and, and, and trying to offer those in five-ounce clamshells. And, and those, we were able to find that we can piggyback right off of you know, the microgreens accounts that we've already established and bring and bring those online as, as quickly as we can scale as, as quickly as we can scale those. So so now what we're doing this this spring is we're planting, you know, a combination of, of all of those things at those different times that I mentioned in those high tunnels. Um, and then what that leaves us is space for um, one just a thirty by forty eight foot tunnel that we plant half Lafanado kale, half curly kale to be able to sell into our um, into our local food co-op here in here in Decora. And then and then from there what we do is with the with the mobile buildings and how that transitions out is um, one of those three by forty eights. So the three mobile ones, we move one and it goes from from those greens and it goes over cut flowers, which we also do outdoors, but that gets us early season cut flower production, which is Katie's favorite favorite thing to do on the farm. And then the other two movable buildings, we slide off of greens, and those go into a combination of early season tomatoes. That and we do we do grape tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, romas, slicers, and and heirlooms. Now we don't plant tomatoes outdoors; we only do high tunnel production early. Um, and then uh, and then the other two bigger tunnels. Um, we've kind of been searching for what to do in the summertime because the, the off-season greens production is really what's driving the infrastructure that we're, that we're building uh, to, to produce in, in those season extended periods of time. So this year what we're going to do is um, we're going to just put one into a combination of four different kinds of melons um, just because that's something that, that we love to eat and our kids love to eat. And um, if we can get those early and, and have those around, I think we should be able to find a, a market for those no problem. Um, you know, there's a big question for us if it's worth growing melons in there. I don't know exactly. We haven't worked through the math. We're just kind of doing this on a whim. But if, you know, if, if those melons are worth it. But it's worth it. It's worth it to us to, to be able to eat those. And then the other 30 by 144, um, we're putting into peppers. And that's going to be... Um, skewed a little heavy towards carmine peppers, but we'll grow uh, carmen bell peppers. And then there's an orange version that just came out that's called Escamillo. Um, and we'll, and we'll grow those. And we've identified that, that we can, we can put those into, into some of those regional markets as well. Um, Gardens of Eden used to grow uh, a fair number of, of those as well. And, and since they're not around, we're going to try to to try to take up at least a little bit of, a little bit of that, uh, that opportunity that presented itself as well. Um, so that'll be kind of where, where they're at during, during the summer. And then, uh, as we get into, as we get into fall, um, we're going to do it just based on the, on the, you know, kind of based on the timing of when those, when those crops have to go in. So, um, for the last two years, we have, we've kind of experimented with, um, just like a two month off season, uh, CSA. It's not really a CSA. It's more of a subscription box program. We do it in November and December because there's probably six or seven uh, summer CSAs that run from from June, uh, you know, first of June through the end of October. And we didn't really want to do that. But as we were pushing production, the reason that we kind of went to that was we were just like, well, we can either keep putting up high tunnels to be able to kind of push this, or we can look for alternative models that allow us to be able to get more uh, you know, more va- more dollars out of those products that we're growing. So instead of doing, you know, salad, you know, bulk salad at, at $6 a pound, if we did it in a CSA and we package them in smaller units, you know, maybe we can get $9 a pound or something like that. So we've played with, we've played with that a little bit. Um, but I think we're, what we're now realizing is that is an immense amount of work to package all those things in such small units um, that, that we're kind of saying, well, 
let's let's just not market that as heavily. We'll we'll take what comes, but we're going to ease off that a little bit, and I think push back into trying to to do these clamshell greens uh, and and have that kind of go in as as long as we can. So um, we'll we'll go back into a lot of a lot of those greens um, in the in the fall. Um, we'll also plant um, some some baby carrots. And those baby carrots go in in mid August. And then our window of planting for a lot of those salad greens um, is really uh, kind of the first week of September through through about the 25th of September. We're we're planting all of those crops like you know spinach and arugula and things like that. Spinach would go in a, a little bit earlier, kind of the, those first couple of weeks of of September, and then we're pushing later plantings of of those you know quick more quickly growing brassicas um, to the to the later part of September. Mike, thanks so much for laying that out for us. I think that's that really great description of kind of your the thinking of the thinking about the process and then and then of of how that actually all comes together. So with that, I'd like to take a turn to our lightning round. What's your favorite tool on the farm, Mike? Yeah, so I was I was thinking about this a lot and I was like, well, I know Chris. Maybe I'll just push him and I'll just say, I can't think of one. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you five. Then I thought that wasn't really fair because that that's not really going along <laughs> with what you're what you're trying to accomplish. And there's lots of those invaluable tools as you kind of look at different parts of the of the farm. But I would have to say that the, what I narrowed it down to when we really sat and thought about it was uh, the that commercial 20 gallon salad spinner that we have. Um, we're just doing so many fresh fresh cut greens, and the fact that that's got a removable basket on it for us has just done uh, just done wonders wonders for us. So I'd have to say that 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 salad spinner. Uh, it takes the it takes spot number one. You're innovating a lot of different things on your farm. I mean, even you know, even just what you're doing with the transplant production um, is not is not something that you can go and attend a workshop about at a conference. What's where do you turn when you need information? What's your favorite resource? I guess what I've what I found is it's just talking to other farmers. Um, you know, reaching out to reaching out to people that may not necessarily be doing exactly what we're trying to do but that may be doing parts of it and if we if i can you know if i know what I, the information that i'm looking for and i can you know i can reach out to to chris blanchard and say hey chris you know you've been working with a germination chamber for you know for 15 years you know what do you think about the one that you have what are the problems that you're having and, and reaching out to the people that are that are really doing those things um, I, I, I think that that's gone a long, a long way. And Katie always jokes, um, you know, that I love, I love to be on my phone. I had, you know, this, I'm like in my element right here with my head, with my headset on. And so when I'm out working, if I can, if I can call somebody up and chat with a buddy of mine that, you know, that's doing something and, and just kind of talk through things or, you know, or say, Hey, you know, I'm thinking about this, tell me if this is crazy and stupid or tell me if this is a good idea and, and kind of work through those things. Um, I would say that, that that's, that that's been really great. So, you know, resource of other, of other farmers and, and through other farmers connecting with people at universities or somebody that may have a lot of that experience. And finally, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Um, yeah, you know, this is something that I've you know, been racking my brain kind of, uh, you know, uh, about as well. And, and I think what I've come back to is, is, um, for me is don't, is don't be afraid to fail. Um, I think with, with the way that, that we, you know, that we've kind of just taken on the farm you know, and we're just, we've just been willing to kind of try to break new ground and, and try things out. And, and it's been, you know, part of it has just been with our location and trying to find those niches and see what works and see what doesn't work. But, but don't be afraid to experiment. Don't be afraid to try things out. Uh, but don't be, a try, don't, don't be afraid to fail. Um, I mean, we, we have failures every year and it's a different crop every year that doesn't seem to do well and you kind of move on. And, and I think that that's one of the things that, that we, you know, that, that we really took from, from Elliot and Barbara and they've been doing that for such a long time. I mean, beyond their just, you know, continuous desire to learn and their inquisitiveness and talking with other people and seeing what other people are doing and just kind of building this community and network. They were never afraid to try something out and fail or, you know, and even in the designing of tools and things like that is, it's just trying to push yourself and try things and some things will work out and some won't, but at least you'll learn things along the, along the way. Awesome. Mike, thank you so much. This has been a a great interview, ton of value, ton of information. I really appreciate your taking the time this morning to share this with us. 
Yeah, it's been great to, to catch up with you a little bit, Chris, and be a part of the podcast. I mean, like so many people have echoed, I mean, this has just been so inv- you know, so invaluable in, in so many ways. It creates conversation for Katie and I when we're listening to podcasts and talking and laughing and have a good, having a good time and listening to other people when, you know, we've got our heads down and we're, we're in the grind, you know, to be able to feel like we're connected to this, you know, this national Aud- you know, group of people that are doing the same things that we're doing. We're we're always learning, and and what you do is absolutely incredible. And 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 so thank you for uh, allowing me to participate and for doing the work that you do. Thank you, Mike. Take care of yourself. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode fifty nine of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and you can find the notes for the show at farmer to farmer podcast dot com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Bollinger. That's B O L L I N G E R. In addition to the podcast, I do publish a newsletter. You can sign up at farmer to farmer podcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. That's my website for my consulting business. If you enjoy the show, please take a moment to pop on over to iTunes and leave us a review. You can also follow us on Facebook at Purple Pitchfork. When you comment on the show notes, leave a review or share an episode on social media. It demonstrates to our sponsors in a tangible way that we have an engaged audience. That makes a huge difference in our ability to continue to put on the show and reach a growing base of listeners. I appreciate so much all of the guest suggestions that I received through the contact form on farmer to farmer podcast.com please let me know who you would like to hear from and i'll do my best to get them on the show thank you for listening be safe out there and keep the tractor running 